Mm, it's the, that's the one right there. Yeah, it tastes good. You can good. taste it. And it's our final ingredient. Where did you start, buddy? Where did you start? Here I am as a kid. Now I'm a washed up pro snowboarder, dad, and curious food nerd, hell bent on new adventures. I'm Josh Rosen. Food and adventure have led me to some of the most interesting places. So we're off on a mission to source the freshest ingredients, all while taking it in through the lens of the locals. And each adventure ends with a feast. This is Dirt. In 1993, I visited Alaska for the first time on a family road trip. I mostly remember eating pancakes in an RV and a few ER visits as a result of some unexpected fishing mishaps. Notice the cast on my right arm. I was no match for Alaska then, but now I'm back with the Dirt fam on a similar route. Let's see what the last frontier has in store for me this time. Welcome to Alaska. beelining it to a spot that's smack dab in the middle of two active volcanoes that sit in the Pacific Ring of Fire. Why do you think they call it a beeline? You ever thought about that? Yeah, good question. Yeah. I got stuck by five feet yesterday to get my cooler out. That was fun. I oh. beelined straight to my house. <laughs> Uh-oh. We're partly here because I saw a nature show about razor clamming on these same beaches. We're also influenced by my dad big razor clam guy. He was also a big rubber boots and short shorts guy. The foragers we came to track down are not the rubber boot wearing humans. It's nice that we're downwind of them. Let me introduce you to our local foraging guide, this 400 pound grizzly. He just pointed that way with the clams. Did he? I think he said, yeah. My partner in crime for this clamming mission is also our chef for the episode, Mr. Dave Thorne, AKA Delicious Dave. He's made a career of private chefing for rock stars. He's also a backcountry badass who sources local ingredients, no matter where the tour bus takes what him. What the hell is that? I think it's a sea pickle. What'd you call me? Turns out, these bears are pretty good foragers and didn't leave much for us. Hey boss, you got any, uh, any dinner yet? Got some rocks. Nice. You know, razor clamming is, is fickle in that way. You Sometimes you get to the beach and there's squirting and you're catching tons and sometimes you come and there's nothing and you break both your shovels. Our romantic oh. idea of eating clams with grizzlies didn't happen. But like all true Alaskans, Dave has a backup plan. A delicious one. Ooh, it smells good up here. You know, being in Alaska, our favorite candy is king crab. <laughs> Local king crab in a wild blueberry field? Yes, please. Yeah, my beard is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Dave can cook just about anywhere. Looking forward to seeing where we end up for the final feast. They're like, what the fuck are these guys doing? <laughs> See you in a few days, Dr. D. Alaska is known as the land of Earth sea, and sky. And here's my sweet little family, in 93, trying to figure out what that means. More than twice the size of Texas, it's no shocker that Alaska has six times as many pilots per capita than any other state. And we're here, at the busiest floatplane airport on planet Earth, with air taxi pilot, 22-year-old Tia Kelleher, who got her license at 18. Right, here we go. Our Alaskan adventure will focus in and around the Kenai Peninsula, the first stop is across the Turnagain Arm, to the southwest end of Prince William Sound, just off the east coast of the Kenai. Gee willikers, them's mountains is huge. Pretty stunning. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And there's a lot of variables that definitely go into account that make you respect nature and know when it's not a good idea to mess with it. But it also makes you appreciate nature. If, like. I feel so grateful and very lucky to get to fly amongst like all these mountains and glaciers and rivers. We are here at the peak of summer. 19 hours of daylight means long days of play, but also work. For many, it's harvest season. All right, cool. 
We're in the ocean, guys. Ten point landing. <laughs> Howdy. Plane to boat. Boat to bigger boat. Chasing down a commercial fishing vessel during an opener ain't easy. But we finally made it to the Chugash Pearl. Stop it, stop it, stop it. And it's in full swing. So these are the foxholes. Living quarters are tight, but the crew seems like a family, spending months at a time at sea together, complete with a toddler and his mother, Captain Cami Cabana. The Cabanas moved to Alaska back in the 50s and are now one of the most established families running boats in Prince William Sound. Cami's raising her boy how she was raised, out at sea. Let's release now. Purse is out! This is a purse seen fishing vessel. When a school of salmon is spotted, a skiff quickly drags the 1,500-foot net out to encircle them. This part can take up to 20 minutes. A cable on the bottom of the net is then cinched tight to prevent the fish from escaping. Then, haul up the catch and put the fish right into refrigerated holding tanks. Thank you, fish. I've got a newfound respect for all my friends who worked fishing rigs in the summer's past. Non-stop coordinated hard work. Now we are off to Seward to get a taste of why they call the Kenai Peninsula Alaska's playground. Seward is one of the oldest settlements in the state, a fur trade hub turned port town supplying goods to the interior. Still humming, now fueled by tourism and fishing. This isn't just a playground for humans. Cue the breaching whale. We're here with a buddy of mine who has made a career showing people just how epic Alaska's playground can be. With a rig like that, we ought to be in good hands. You will normally find Jeff flying around in helis as a big mountain ski guide. But today, we are taking to jet skis, the snowmobiles of the sea. He's brought us to a zone called Resurrection Bay, where glaciers flow from the Harding Ice Field into coastal fjords. Not bad, Jeff. Not bad. Grilled ribs were great. My knee, after a weird entry off a 70-foot cliff, not so much. We are surrounded by wildlife. The unique ecosystem of this place allows for biodiversity unlike anywhere else in the world, including these humpback whales, and a favorite of mine, blackfish. 19 hours and the sun hasn't hit the horizon. Just now realizing what we've gotten ourselves into. I'm not tired. You tired? Here we go. And we continue south on the Dirt Family Road Trip. If you haven't figured it out yet, it's fishing season. We're following these boats just off the coast to the halibut capital of the world. Located on a unique piece of geography that juts out 4.5 miles into the Cook Inlet, we've arrived at the spit. Right over here is the Homer Harbor, the Homer Public Trains. So here we are, living the good times, right? <laughs> Meet Billy, a fixture of the spit since the 80s. He spends his off season chasing swell in Mexico, but always makes it home in time for the season opener. From May through September, he works these docks seven days a week, part of a well-oiled team that receives about 100,000 pounds of halibut every day. I kind of like the rainy days. We got sunny yesterday, and then you're just like, what do you, you know? This almost makes you feel better, doesn't it? Boats of blind-caught halibut are brought into the harbor every day. These behemoths are sorted by weight, then iced. This is what they call a chicken, right? This is a small one. So it's like the small guys. Ugh, look at this fish, huh? That's 100 pounds? Oh yeah, at least 120. Well, you want to pick out a fish that yeah. you want? One of the chickens? Yeah. Like this, this is like Perfect. the smallest size, yeah? You gotta do it, yeah. like everybody does. I always kiss the fish, man, I love them. You know, I love them. Onward with the Upco bike to get this chicken filleted for delicious Dave. Well, yeah, we call halibut butts here, um, so. We're butt whackers and... You whack butts. Exactly. Ijin and her team fillet fish for charters, private boats and fisheries. Check out this knife work. So I always start with my cheek. A lot of people go really crazy for the halibut cheeks of here. Of course. It's right behind the eyes. Sure. And it kind of just peels right off the skin. 
Um, I do a collar cut and then there's a midline yeah. down the center of a halibut. And that kind of uh, tells you exactly where to cut. And I do a little trace cut around the outside. I think yeah. that my fillets get cleaner that way. Got it. And then the trick is having a real flexible blade that you can just kind of glide along the bone structure of the yeah. halibut. And that's why you get those nice boneless fillets off of Got halibut. Got it. Buttwhackers is conveniently located next to the Salty Dog. Drinks for the crew. It's impossible not to imagine what life must have been like before all of this. First, the Inuits, then Russian fishermen and coal miners, gold miners, more fishermen, and farmers, all with the same frontier spirit. Yule Kilcher fled Switzerland during World War II to homestead this property, bushwhacking for two months over the mountains from Seward to get here. And his oldest daughter, Mossy, still remembers that time like it was yesterday. Hey guys, come on. Yoo-hoo! I could spend the next week telling stories about my cow days. Yeah, I loved my cows. I was more like Heidi with her cows. They would follow me, or I would walk with them instead of having, you know, cattle drives. We, we called them jokingly cattle walks. My little sister laid underneath here yeah. in a compartment, and she would take off down the beach. And I can still remember this wonderful feeling of just cruising down the beach with a horse, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, you know, all the way to Homer to grab a few little goodies from the store. Oh, I know what I can tell you guys. You know what my biggest inspiration was when I was a kid? Mm. Winnie the Pooh. Mossy has certainly created her own 100-acre wood here. She's Christopher Robin. This is a world where every horse, and cow, and bird has been given a thoughtful name, a story, just like maybe even a song. Listen to the fox sparrow along the cliffs of Catchamac, high above the windy shore. A little sparrow sings the song. Almost 80 years I've been, I, I, I've been on this beach. I know every inch of this beach. I've gone up and down this beach so many times. Oh, here we go, another one. Woo! Here we go. You can go for miles like this. It's just a fun challenge. Each rock is different, right? <laughs> Whoops! Uh oh, that was fun. <laughs> I figure the the secret to staying young and to happiness is to play, play at everything, even if it's serious stuff. Just turn it into a game, play it, <laughs> make fun at, make yeah, fun yeah, with yeah. it. Um, yes. Come on. Okay, it's I, I hate to take away okay? from Mossy's world, but we gotta keep on. And now let's head across the bay from the hundred acre wood to Neverland. But yeah, and there's a public dock, and then there's Grant's house, the Fritz's, and the next one is the Everly's, the next one's Nancy and Catherine's. This is Halibut Cove. Only accessible by boat or plane, there are no roads here, and everybody knows your name. Like, you know everybody, like those people in the skiff. Yeah. I know them, and then the people in the other skiff. That's Margo. This sea otter's name is Jeff. He's pretty old, he's a male. He's not, yeah, he's not too scared of people. You can get pretty close to him. Jeff's just always chilling. He's just, he doesn't want to get his hands wet, so he's not gonna dive down. If there's one thing we know about Jeff, he hates getting his hands wet. <laughs> and I have a pig named Jeff. Can you come pick me up now? If you can't already tell, Rockwell was born and raised in Halibut Cove and is totally a product of this place. So what, for you, what does that, what does it mean to be Alaskan? Um, just being in the wilderness, just yeah. being connected to the land and the nature. His parents, Greg and Weatherly, moved here to start a shellfish farm after seeing the depletion of the fishing industry back east. They came here with intention to raise their oysters and their kids in harmony with nature. And we've arrived at the family shellfish farm. Should we bag some up? All right, we'll do a count of 120. The Bates family produces 20% of the oysters in all of Alaska from this one cove, one of the northernmost shellfish farms in the world. Oh, breakfast. Breakfast, the 8 a.m. oyster. It's one of the most sustainable operations we've seen on all of our dirt travels, complete with an honor system farm stand, offering glacier-fed oysters and wild-set mussels. 
Rivera's not here. I know. So we rely on an ecosystem-based approach to farming. Oysters are the crop that we actually plant on our farm, but the kelps and mussels are just natural. They're wild set, they call it. So they just come and settle in and on the gear and we grow them from there. Beautiful. A benefit of farming this way is the abundance of wild kelp that grows on all the lines. Allowing these kelps to grow keeps the biodiversity and nutrients of the farm healthy and in balance. And then we have ducks and geese and chickens and dogs, as you can hear. Uh -huh. That one's Jeff. That <laughs> one's Alder. Kelp is hung and left to dry for three to five days. And we're pretty sure Rockwell is the only 15-year-old with his own self-harvested kelp blend. I came here for the first time when I was 13. You never know when you will return to a place. I'm back on what happens to be my 45th birthday, dinner at the Saltry, swimming with otters, and participating in an Alaskan classic, <laughs> the hurricane shot. Thanks for that one, Jeff. Peter Pan said, all children, except one, grow up. I think it's two, because I'm, I'm a kid forever. And with all of these sentimental celebrations, we almost forgot to introduce you to the unofficial mayor of Halibut Cove, Dr. Martha. You go up on shoulders. Rockwell warned us about missions with Martha, but we had no idea what we were getting into. An epic paddle across tidal pools with one usable paddle. Two mile trudge through mud with a 30 pound bag of spear fishing gear I would never use. We caught up with Martha, just in time to witness an Alaskan summer tradition. For the month of July, locals can use dip nets to catch up to six salmon a day. Now to satyrs like me can use rods to snag fish or oh, camera people. The summer tradition is all about harvesting food for the winter. Got it. Oh. I learned the hard way that you no. always need to retie a knot when someone hands you a rod. And about six hours later, we're finally back to Martha's dock. Martha, tell me about this journey that we just went on. Well, it was uh, primitive. It was primitive. And yet complex. That is true. You're on harvest. You're just, just in a harvest mode. Yeah, this is food. These fish will be cut, brined, and smoked then canned to eat throughout the year. There it is. And look at how beautiful that is. This is food. We're on the tail end of our trip, and we're stopping off at a ski town, which started out as a supply camp for gold miners. Hand-built A-frames, quirky coffee shops, and a local ski hill with 250,000 feet of vert I like it here. Kate. Hey there. Josh. Nice to meet you, Josh. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Girdwood. Thanks. You're gonna need a bigger basket. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person to tell me that. We're here in the northernmost rainforest with a local who moved here for her true loves, oh, skiing there. There and fungi. I think we got a mushroom. Oh, wow. That is beautiful. So this is a? Let's find out. These are bolete mushrooms, also known as a porcini. So it's really curious. What's normally um, supposed to occur as you move north of the equator is your species diversity is supposed to decline. That doesn't happen with fungi. It doesn't happen with lichens. Like one of the most biodiverse hot spots for lichens, for example, is in so Southeast Alaska. I just read the stat last night. It was over 1,300 species of lichens found in four national parks in Southeast Alaska. It's incredible. So the diversity in the forest isn't the trees, it isn't the plants, it's the cryptic things like lichens and fungi and insects. 
Yeah. So I, do I give uh, the fisheries people a hard time? Yeah, when they're like, well, we have five species of salmon. You're like, it's cute. And <laughs> <laughs> scene. Out of the jungle and back to the sea. A phenomenon is coming. And the locals are out two times a day to catch it or spectate. This is a surfable bore tide wave like no other. It happens when the outgoing tide and the incoming tide crash into one another, forming a rideable wave. Yep, that's me on the pink longboard, more excited than ever. However, this bore tide was not friendly to the out-of-town kook. Bye. I really hope to see you again another day. The only way to heal a pearled ego is with a cold one at the one and only Coots in downtown Anchorage. Yeah. So you put your face on here and blow a tune. Didn't expect to walk out of there with my undies stapled to the ceiling, but that's a story for another time. I got wicked wanded, and I'm totally okay with it. See what's in here? Yeah, dude, let's, let's take a look. We're back in the bird with delicious Dave, and he's taking us to a mostly untapped mountain range 75 miles outside of Anchorage for the final feast. Where did you start, buddy? Where did you start? Here I come. Is it funny because I have limp running? It's not nice. What are you what are you looking for in an ice? Really uh, clarity, uh, no minerality, uh, age. Look for age and terroir, lack of. Because nothing goes with a Hirsch whiskey like 10,000 year old water. Mm, old. Whoa, burr, chili wills. That's a cold, that's a cold puddle. Ooh. Okay, we're gonna come down this ridge and then we're gonna come right down this booger's right. That sounds great. Don't go left. How did I get this insane gig? Thank you, Huckberry. Cooking at 4,000 feet with 360 degree glacier views, this is the first for all of us. We're wrapping up our trip in the land of 100,000 glaciers, 38,000 mountains, and a crop of locals as rugged as they come, attempting to embrace the glory of it all. Yeah, you wanna, do, you wanna be the shucker? Oh, shucks, buddy. Ah, oh, shucks, bring your ass over here. What do we do right in our past lives to deserve this? This is a fitting end to an epic journey where I felt the power of this natural world, how it sucks people into the extremes of work and play. A perfect place for this ragtag crew. Who needs sleep anyway? John Muir wrote, you shouldn't head to Alaska as a young man because you'll never be satisfied with any other place as long as you live. I couldn't agree more. Ruled by nature, defined by its beauty, fueled by the frontier spirit of its people, Alaska. Can't wait to see you again.